Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to everybody here in person. Welcome online. My name is Michael Mosser. I'm the executive director of the Global Disinformation Lab here at the University of Texas at Austin. And it's my great pleasure to kick things off this morning uh, by giving you a bit of an introduction to our uh, first keynote speaker. Um, but before I do, I'd like to say, I'd, I'd like to extend uh, our sincere appreciation, thanks to our sponsors, Texas Global, the Office of the Vice President for Research and the Intelligence Studies Project here at the University of Texas at Austin uh, for helping to sponsor this particular event. Um, today's speaker, today's keynote speaker is Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Ukraine to the United States of America, Oksana Markarova. Uh, Oksana Makarova was appointed Ukraine's ambassador to the United States and arrived in Washington in April 2021. She served in Ukraine's Ministry of Finance uh, from 2015 to 2020 as first deputy minister and government commissioner on investments, and then since 2018 as minister of finance. During her time at the ministry, she was co-author of Ukraine's macroeconomic revival program. Prior to her career in public service, Mrs. Makarova spent 17 years working in private equity and financial advising uh, and had leadership roles in the ITT Investment Group, the Western NIS Enterprise Fund, Chemonix, and the World Bank, as well as founding Archidata Startup uh, Electronic Archives. Oksana Makarova uh, holds a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in Environmental Science from Kyiv Moya Academy in Ukraine, and an MPA in Public Finance from Indiana University uh, with Academic Excellence and Best International Student Awards. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Makarova. It is also my pleasure to introduce our moderators for this particular panel who will be handling the moderating duties. Uh, we've got to your right, to the audience's right, Miroslava Gongadze and Jeff Trimble in the middle. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Miroslava. Thanks very much. To Oksana. Yeah, exactly, to Oksana. <laughs> I don't know why I have Miroslava there. Yes, to Oksana, yes. Madam Ambassador, Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mulzer. It's, it's such a great pleasure and honor to be with you today at University of Texas. And I look forward to the discussion moderated by unbelievable Miroslava Gongadze. That's why you wanted to turn to her yeah, right her. away. Uh, we are discussing a very important subject today and truly fascinating subject. This is the importance of uh, uh, propaganda, disinformation warfare, and uh, how to counter it have been underscored since the Cold War era, but actually even before that. When we think today about the propaganda or disinformation, it's hard to believe that there are so many changes that occurred since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and yet there are almost no changes that occurred in Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Just think about it. For decades, Soviet government spent millions of dollars to jam the signals of Voice of America, the outlet um, we all love today, just to prevent people in the Soviet Union from alternative information presented by the foreign media broadcasts. Uh, and for the last 20 years of the Putin regime, but in general in the Russian Federation, they have been also investing millions, if not billions of dollars, again, to have not only suppress, suppressing the free flow of speech inside Russia, but also to deliver their propaganda and their disinformation everywhere under the guise of more nuanced interpretation of the international events. Ukraine, and for the, for the matter of the fact, the United States have been primary target, targets of this Russian disinformation over the last decade, especially. Uh, it, we developed, you know, a deep understanding of how it works. And of course, this information has started and disinformation started long before the full phase, war, phase of this war has started in 2022. Actually, when we have more time, we can even talk about the previous 300 years of disinformation. The Russian empire has been spreading about all of its neighbors and especially about Ukraine and the disinformational attack the recent disinformational attack is based on the centuries of the propaganda. But of course, in 2014, when Russia attacked and annexed illegally Crimea and also attacked part of the Donetsk and Lugansk region, 
this propaganda came into a whole new level. Uh, they first even tried to do a pretext of Ukrainians discriminating Russian speakers in those regions. Uh, they also claimed that Ukraine suffered a revival of so-called fascist state. They tried to put all kinds of unbelievable blames, uh, absolutely unfounded, on Ukraine. And it constantly misrepresented all Ukrainian governments, especially those that were in place after the revolution of dignity, after Maidan, after Ukraine said no to return to Russia. Federation and firmly went back on the democratic, pro-democratic path. Now, of course, in February 22, when uh, the full-fledged war uh, phase of this war, uh, which started in 2014, uh, has started, the narrative was increased even more. So um, it's not, Russia not only pretended that uh, the war of aggression was out of the necessity, as they said, to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Uh, they have spread again all kinds of lies and truths in their public speaking, uh, in their television, but also outside. But this time they have miscalculated badly. And this time around, uh, the world has finally gotten its act together, together with Ukraine, also to have the strong response to this disinformation efforts. So the United States and European Union have closed the outlets like Russia Today and Sputnik. The several Russian propagandists, quite a number of them, have been sanctioned by the US and the EU. The YouTube, which was also remarkable, has taken down more than 70,000 videos and 9,000 channels, which, were not, 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 which had nothing to do with the freedom of speech, but have been the vehicles of the delivering the Russia propaganda, Russian propaganda and disinformation, especially about the war uh, in Ukraine. Additional government institutions and think tanks were opened in the United States to analyze and counter this propaganda. And thanks to all the efforts since February 24th, Russian attempts to weaponize disinformation have not reached its goals. So it has been very important to understand that this inf disinformation campaigns went hand in hand with military attacks, with aggression that was happening on the ground. So in internationally, the Kremlin still unfortunately continues to use this manipulation handbook in attempts to undermine the international support to Ukraine. So they have lost uh, an attempt to explain how this is not the war, they were not the ones who attacked us. They know that is almost impossible to explain because, again, thanks to very brave journalists who from day one, again, unlike in 2014, have been everywhere in Ukraine and have been showing the truth, it's very difficult to deny everything. Even though we remember how they tried to deny that Bucha happened or the atrocities in Kherson happened, but it's very difficult to do it when there are a number of resources which are showing the truth. But now they're trying to use this disinformation in a more, I would even say, smart way. And we have to be even more diligent because they're trying to use it to drive wedges between us and the West, Western countries among themselves, between EU and European Union. They have, uh, you know, accused NATO all the time about attempts to encircle, destroy, somehow move closer to Russia, whereas there was not, NATO never moved closer to Russia. It's the individual countries that want to join NATO, and it's actually Russia that is driving all of us away from them. So losing today on the battlefield in Ukraine, Russia doubled down on also domestic propaganda front, which we also have to take into consideration. The censorship, complete destruction of independent media, uh, is the way for Kremlin to block uh, completely any meaningful opposition to this war. What's worse also, they started since February 2022 working on making genocide as something normal, you know, showing these images from Bucha and Kherson and destruction of Mariupol and trying to say that this is in response to so-called Russophobia. This is what they were forced to do. So they're trying to normalize somehow this. And history has many examples of normalization uh, of, of genocides, unfortunately, and devastating effects of that on the entire nation. From Nazi Germany, which we all studied, of course, uh, to the justified, as they claimed, killings 
of Jews, Slavs, Roma, sexual minorities, whoever they wanted to name as the enemies of the state, to the Radio de Mil Collins in that played a significant role in Rwandan genocide. And it has been described as uh, the death by radio or radio genocide. Well, the Russian TV and the entire propaganda that Russian is doing today is a present day soundtrack to genocide. It is the radio of genocide or TV of genocide. And they need to, for that to be stopped, is not only existential for my country's fight uh, with, with, for our independence, for our homes, for our freedom, but it's also absolutely critical for all of us who believe in democracy, who believe in freedom of information, the freedom of speech, because we have to differentiate clearly between the weaponized propaganda and the freedom of speech. And we have to strengthen all of our efforts to be truly resilient against this malign and disinformation and this malign influences in order to not only return to peace in Europe and in Ukraine, but also see how we can protect democracies everywhere from this malign uh, disinformation, which could be Russian. It's a great case, and this is something we are dealing with, but there are a number of other actors who would like to use this as the weapon. So thank you very much again for having me. Thank you for raising this very important topic, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Um, thank you for being with us today and presenting Ukrainian position in this uh, war. Um, I would be uh, joined uh, by uh, Jeff Trimble um, to moderate uh, and help you to talk to our audience as well. So uh, I would st start with what you already uh, said about the coverage of this war. Uh, before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, it was difficult to attract journalists, foreign journalists, to the country. Unfortunately, only war brought hundreds and hundreds of uh, journalists to, um, to Ukraine to cover this war. And since the uh, full-scale invasion, uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine, eight journalists already were killed uh, during uh, their professional work in Ukraine. One of these journalists, uh, my colleague, first casualty of this war, um, uh, my colleague from, uh, from Harvard, he went to cover Irpin um, in Irpin um, battle and he, he was shot by Russian soldier right there. Um, I, Oksana, I would like to ask you, how do you assess the foreign uh, journalist coverage of this war? And do you um, see any mistakes that maybe uh, uh, foreign journalists do while uh, covering this war? Thank you. Thank you, Miroslava. Well, first of all, we are very grateful to everyone who was there from day one. And as you said, we have lost so many, unfortunately, uh, including, you know, I'm very grateful to, uh, to to the journalist who was covering Irpin and Max Levin, who was killed also near Irpin in the forest. And there are on and on and on so many Ukrainian and international journalists. Well, first of all, um, I think this time, uh, it we have to thank the, all the news agencies for actually mobilizing the resources quickly and sending the journalists out. And more importantly, right now, we have to keep people in. Uh, of course, it takes a lot of courage to be on the front lines. But again, the game changer was that people were not only in Lviv and in Kiev and even at the you know, uh, front line in places like Irpin, but also they, they are now as close as it is possible to the fight that is happening in the East. Now, uh, I wouldn't talk about the mistakes because, frankly, I think, you know, we, uh, like, I, I, I could not uh, think of a big mistake that anyone uh, would, would make, although at the beginning, especially of, the, of this uh, phase of the war, a lot of time at the embassy here, we spent on correcting the, the, the titles, you know, when people were talking about Ukraine conflict, conflict in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian crisis, you know, instead of calling it what it is, Russians war against Ukraine or Russians aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we also had to remind people that the war started in 2014. Uh, so again, I, when I mentioned that there was years, if not centuries of Russian propaganda before, we all have to be very, uh, 
diligent in not only remembering it, but also working really hard, uh, both the government, the civil society, but journalists on correcting even our own misperceptions. So that when we report the truth, we do not actually make it less important with the previous misperceptions that might have been there. And again, Ukraine, unfortunately, for the most part, have been seen, including in the West, including among our friends, through the lenses of the Russian narratives. You know, as, for example, titling Ukraine as the former Soviet Union country. I sometimes, you know, even make jokes. I say we do not say that U.S. is the former Great Britain's territory, right? You know, of course, it has been 30 years of the renewed independence, but it's about time to start calling Ukraine for what it is, an independent country that used to be independent, that actually was independent in 1918, got independence together with Finland, was occupied by the Soviet Union and regained independence. So I think if I were to mention something where the additional work is needed is a correcting this to some people seemingly not important connotations, which are very important because how you call, how do you define uh, things are very important in information and media. And second, stay in the course. So when, I, when I'm asked by the journalist here, is there is something we do not, do not report in? What do you want us to pay attention more, for example? I just say, you know, just increase your presence, be everywhere. Report on everything you think important, but it's very important to stay the course and not to lessen the presence in Ukraine, but actually widen it. Actually, uh, Madam Ambassador, good morning. Jeff Trimble here. I'd like to draw you out a little bit more on Ukraine's public diplomacy and strategic messaging um, uh, efforts in this context. There are those who maintain that governments in democratic countries in particular cannot do successful public diplomacy uh, and information efforts in the chaotic, fast-moving, modern media environment. Governments, they say, are too slow, they're too bureaucratic, they're too risk-averse, Yet Ukraine, I would say, has very skillfully dominated the information narrative since Russia launched the war against your country. Can you talk a bit about Ukraine's public diplomacy efforts and your trade craft? What's the secret to Ukraine's success in public diplomacy and strategic messaging around the war? Thank you. Well, first of all, as someone who joined the government in 2015, and my old background is in the private sector before that, I can agree that governments are too slow and too bureaucratic and usually uh, do not do what we as government need to do as soon as possible. Now, as a, having said that, uh, I, I also agree with you that since 2022, Ukraine has been showing a very, I would say, unconventional approach to not only informing the world, but also to public diplomacy. And uh, it is amazing what you, you are able to do uh, when, you know, your life depends on it. So uh, we all understand that it's existential for our country. We all understand that it's, it's the moment when we either make it or break it in this century. So um, I think, you know, the first day of the attack, when our president Zelensky went out with his phone and you know, when we didn't know whether the connection will be there, whether, you know, they will attack or completely destroy the the, uh, the communication networks in Ukraine. And he went out just with his cell phone and he said, I'm here, everyone's here, he, this is what it is, I'm not leaving, I'm fighting, everyone is fighting. And since that, that day, he started doing what I think no president did before, communicating directly with the people on the regular basis, not only with the people in Ukraine, but also outside, so that people knew that this is a source of information that we can rely upon, that we know what's happening and we know what the government is doing. And also the diplomatic service, also you know how uh, in general conservative and risk averse diplomacy is, you know, you have to double check everything, you have to craft the message, you have to agree it with Kiev, you have to uh, you know, put it in the terms that uh, will take into account all the interests, not only that particular event. But we have, again, understood from the day one that if we are to do that, we would always be behind. 
and we would not be able to deliver the information, to deliver the message, but also rally the support as, as much as we need it. Because again, our lives depended on it. So again, like our president, the foreign minister uh, has made a number of changes. First, the, the uh, you know the de- de- regulating and uh, delegating a lot to the ambassadors, uh, so that we could go ahead and just you know do and communicate and defend uh, to the best possible uh, you know way we can. Uh, we also uh, changed a lot how which we exchange the information in a more fast way so that we can inform each other among ambassadors and with the center and with all the decision makers. Uh, so I think there will be a lot of case studies after we win, uh, of course, because there is no time for that uh, right now on uh, how the internal flow of information, how sharing of the data, how vetting what is fact and what is not has been done. And then at the end of this process, the diplomatic force that has been taking that and then delivering on it, talking to partners, talking to the general public, going to the media. And I also have to say that uh, I probably had uh, talked to the press more during this year than ever in my life. I mean, even when I was the Minister of Finance and I had to inform the public, of course, on the regular basis, uh, it it wasn't like that. But again, this is uh, when you ask yourself, you know, I don't remember who said this phrase, like, what would you do if you were not afraid? Uh, this is this is a very uh, important question to ask. Like, you know that the alternative is is a very bad alternative. So whatever you are comfortable or not comfortable with, you have to go ahead and do it. And um, I think you know again there are lessons learned for other democracies which are not at war. That this is something that works. We have to do it. We have to be more quick. We have to go and refute when we see the lies. We have to be very straightforward and not kind of diplomatic about some of the things. If it's lie, we have to call it a lie and we have to be very public about it. Your good answer has anticipated my follow-up question, which is a bit more about tradecraft. So you as ambassador in Washington, if there is a breaking news event to which you feel you need to react, you have the freedom to react to that without necessarily clearing messaging with Kiev, that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, if indeed you diplomats in the field and others are free to answer and respond as you see fit, inevitably that will produce some inconsistency in messaging. You're not always going to get it right. Is that something you're simply prepared to accept as a price you pay in order to be properly responsive in the digital age? Very, very important uh, question. First, of course, um uh, there is uh, 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 there are sensitive things that I have to clear clear, clear with Kiev, uh, but uh, in general, everything that has to deal with our bilateral relations with the U.S., uh, I think it's 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 almost like a two way street, and we are providing information to Kiev as much as we're getting information from Kiev. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, there could be mistakes when you react quickly to something, especially think about the time difference. Sometimes I have to answer to something when Kiev, when there is night in Kiev. Uh, and uh, again, uh, there is a very uh, small number of uh, issues on which I really would say, you know, look, I have to uh, talk to Kiev about it before I can even comment on it. Uh, and I will try to react right away to the best of my abilities. Now, am I um, thinking that there might be a mistake? I mean, of course, this is my worst nightmare to say something that then you have to correct or, uh, you know, uh, that's something that will be damaging. Thanks God it didn't happen so far, uh, uh, not on a large scale at least. But I think in the, in the times of war, this is the risks you have to take uh, because Sometimes to respond quickly to some disinformation uh, is is even more important than, you know, go through all the processes of clearing it and then being behind when the disinformation already spreads. So uh, there is always balance in that, of course. 
Thank you, Oksana, and uh, I can um, uh, testify to uh, to what you said because you're one of the best uh, ambassador Ukraine has, and you do respond to uh, to journalists very quickly and uh, efficiently. Um, I would like to go back to to the war issue and uh, role of journalists in the war. Um, you mentioned in your uh, speech, uh, Bucha Irpin, uh, you mentioned mentioned war crimes. You um, mentioned that this war can be basically first war uh, in the history that can be watched online. Uh, it's a digital war. And I would like to ask you about um, a role of a journalist in documenting uh, war crimes. Uh, I have been to Bucha recently and Irpin when they discovered the mass graves. And um, how do you see this this role uh, for to later bring uh, the justice to victims of this Russian war? Thank you, Miroslava. This is actually a very important question, and it's 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 a, there are a number of dimensions to that question. First, the role of journalists in documenting it is invaluable. I think you know no one can uh, deny that. It's because of the journalists we have heard about some sense. Uh, the journalists have moved faster to some of the locations than uh, the civil society, the, the, especially the law enforcement. And uh, without journalists, some of the evidence would be lost. So, uh, you know, sometimes when they get there, and again, people trust journalists a little bit more, especially after very horrible experiences, when they see people with the cameras, uh, unless they are like really shy, you know, they would be willing to, to say something, show something. And the camera can be uh, a great witness in itself, you know, just by capturing what it was there uh, and, and then could, could be very valuable. Now, on uh, using that footage or using those materials later on, first, of course, uh, it's very useful for the investigators because you can use it as a reference point. You can use it as uh, additional material. But in order to make it admissible in the court of law, because, of course, ultimately we all talk about justice and not only we want to show it in order to prove that that happened, but also to keep people accountable. That's a whole different, very complex area. And uh, right now we are working with the U.S. a lot with the Atrocities Crime Group and others in the Department of Justice and Department of State specifically on, on getting the civil society and mass media together to uh, educate them how to do it properly so that not only this footage or witnesses uh, or witness records taken could be uh, for the sake of showing the truth, but also could be later on used. Uh, one very sensitive element of that, of course, is victims. You know, on the one hand, it's very important and sometimes victims are ready to share at the beginning when they are liberated. We've seen it in Kherson, in Bucha, elsewhere. Then even later on, when they return to, you know, uh, to their lives and without psychological help, sometimes try not to talk about that more. On the other hand, it's very also important not to re-traumatize victims. So that's another whole area of, uh, uh, you know, challenge, how to work together for media civil society, psychologists, and law enforcement in order not to take this witness uh, statements uh, more than 10 times for different purposes. So I think this is the area where, again, we can praise the media for an, a lot of help, but this is also the area which is evolving and where we have to work more together. I mean, the state, the civil society, media, international partners, and law enforcement in order to find ways how to do it properly when you deal with atrocities of that massive proportion, especially as we are preparing for the counteroffensive, especially as we hope and pray that soon we'll liberate more territories. These are the territories that have been under occupation for more than a year. The longer they stay under occupation, the more horrible it is, the more difficult things we will see after we get back, back there. So uh, we have to be, on the one hand, more proactive, but on the other, more careful about it. In the um, Thank you, Madam Ambassador. In the final few minutes we have, we'd welcome taking 
questions from the audience or moderated questions online, if there are any, we can continue to ask questions, but if there are any questions in the audience, would you raise your hand? We'd be glad to give you a microphone. Or online, colleagues, if there's anything coming in that you are moderating. Don't be shy. <laughs> I see back in the, all the way back in the back. Can we bring you a microphone or is there one, Michelle, is there one available? Stand by just a moment, Madam Ambassador. We've got a question in the back of the auditorium and she will have a microphone in just a moment. I'm Jessica Dawson from the Army Cyber Institute. I'm wondering, um, early on in, in the conflict, um, it seemed like there was a lot of, of information going on and the usage of Twitter in terms of memes. And I know a lot of people tend to dismiss memes as very stupid and imm immature, but it seems like memes have been a critical part of, of helping expand the, the message and reach new audiences and build support for Ukraine. Um, can you talk about that at all? Or do you think it's just a very small part of the overall process? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, no, I think memes uh, not only play, but continue to play very crucial part of that. First, it's uh, an information easy to consume. Uh, second, it's usually uh, with a great humor. And I know war and humor uh, is not the two things you want to put together, but you have to also, we have to understand that uh, all of our friends and allies uh, colleagues outside of Ukraine are not on the war footing. So, you you know, on the one hand, we have to show the truth. We have to show the atrocities. We have to show the horrible things that we see. But there is also a degree of how much a person living in Germany, France or US or any other uh, country can take it. You know, it, it's also uh, very difficult to watch only that all the time. And uh, what is better way to, uh, you know, show that we can win, uh, laugh a little bit about the aggressors, you know, especially when uh, Mr. Putin or people around him are making their ridiculous claims, which, which are uh, as atrocious as actually stupid and funny. So I, I think, you know, memes is the way for us to get to a much wide, wider audience. And also we have to remember that memes are not something that was generated by the government of Ukraine. It's all the Ukrainians, you know, all the civil society, people in business who would put it out because this is what they are going through. This is their, uh, you know, accounts, the artists in Ukraine, you know, the creativity boom that we have seen during this horrible, horrible 13 months have also helped us to get the message across to different audiences. So, no, I, I believe it's uh, a very important element and uh, it's the element we cannot of course take the the credit for but i think it helped us a lot and we have seen also memes being very efficient not only during the war time but during the revolution of dignity you know during the time when civil society in ukraine when we were fighting against Yanukovych regime, when the policies have been tightening in Ukraine, it was the jokes about it that actually put the first cracks in it. That's right. And uh, uh, Oksana, not only civil society, uh, the Ukrainian military uh, are very efficient and yes. uh, make very interesting videos with songs when uh, soldiers are singing, using uh, animals, using different way to actually not just tell the horrible story of war, but inspire. And it's very important to keep that inspiration because Ukraine is fighting the war, but Ukraine is inspiring the world as well by standing together and uh, fighting and being brave. Uh, Jill uh, has a question. Thank you very much. It is. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yes, Great. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, thank you very much. Jill Doherty, we know each other from D.C., Georgetown University, and the Wilson Center. Um, I wanted to ask a question which is more immediate, and I know it's a difficult question because the uh, aspects, the, the uh, breadth of information that has been leaked, uh, the Pentagon documents that have come out, are very concerning. And I know that it will be very difficult for you to specifically um, talk about that. Can you understand, can you hear me? 
Okay. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, and I just wanted to see if you could, at this stage, very early stage, give us an understanding of how you think this type of leak, which does appear to be obviously on purpose, we think, could affect things because not only the information per se, but the fact that it was leaked and what is in there in terms of the United States uh, allegedly spying on um, allies, et cetera, could be very damaging. So just wondering if you can make at least a comment at this point uh, about that. Well, at this point, we cannot even say whether the leak actually occurred and whether we can call it a leak and whether it was leak or completely uh, construed documents or whatever it was. So no, I will not be able to comment. The only thing I, I would say is that anything coming from Russians, we have to take with a, a great degree of uh, uh, disbelief and salt and just understand that whatever they do uh, is the goal of Russians now, as I said in my opening remarks, is uh, since they were not able to conquer us in three days, they were not able to tell everyone that it's not them, like they did in 2014, that they were not able to lie, that uh, they did not attack us, there is no war, there is some kind of special operation liberating uh, God knows who. Uh, their goal now is actually to decrease the trust which has been increasing during the 13 months between us and Europe, us and the US, between US and Europe. And uh, they will do anything in order to undermine this trust. And they will do anything in order to weaken the coalition of the willing, which for the first time have seen Russia for what it is, an autocratic, absolutely corrupt, absolutely unhumane uh, country. Uh, that does not adhere to any rules or international order. So uh, I would uh, advise anyone to be very careful about, you know, jumping on any information that is coming from, uh, from Russia. And I think as soon as we hear more about, uh, you know, any possible investigations that will be there and analysis of this, and there is a lot of data analysis from independent sources already, uh, we will we will clearly see for what it is. We have a question. Online. Uh, we no. have, we have a question online from Lee McIntyre. Lee, take it away. No. Hi, um, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Um, the U.S. government has not been very good at fighting disinformation, especially when it's laundered through domestic channels. Part of this, I think, is a fear of being accused of partisanship. This is, I think, some of the debate over free speech in the United States is based on uh, disinformation that it is impossible to fight disinformation and not harm free speech. And this is, of course, what foreign disinformers want us to think. Is there any advice that you might have for how the USA could, the US government could fight better against disinformation? This is the question for all of us, I, I would say. So I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, that either of the governments are doing it much better or much worse, to be honest. It's that we have to remind all of, to, to all of us, uh, that we have to find that very careful balance about, again, not violating the freedom of speech, not violating and not restricting the information which is true but uncomfortable, right? Uh, and the total disinformation. And I think the role of the uh, civil society, journalists, anal analytical centers, think tanks, universities is crucial there because you are the impartial ones uh, who can actually differentiate between the two. Because it's very easy uh, for government to be uh, accused by, uh, when they are fighting with disinformation, to be accused that they're actually stepping on the freedom of press. Uh, and I think, you know, this is where we would really appreciate all of us, either in the government of Ukraine or in the government of, of the US or any other country, if there will be more uh, kind of like guidance and fact checks and uh, clear positions from the expert society. And also, again, as I said, it's not only about uh, Russia 
Russian war in Ukraine, it's not only about a traditional media, but I think we all have to understand that with the uh, massive use of the social networks and, and social media, with access to children, to this um, massive amounts of information, frankly, before they ever develop even a critical thinking skills, you know, analysis. And when we were in, in high school, all of us, you know, the previous generation, people in the audience might think about us as dinosaurs a little bit, but, you know, we didn't have access to any of the digital information. We developed tools. How do you use library? How do you find useful information? How do you differentiate between the yellow press, which you can buy on the, in the streets, or about the books or the dictionaries? We have to, the expert society have to work faster in order to develop something like that for the digital sphere so that we can actually differentiate between a wonderful scientific project done by or a program died by discovery or some blogger who now can do equally uh, uh, you know high quality and appealing video content which might be based on completely false disinformation or something like that. So I think the issue is much bigger than that. And that's where the universities and think tanks and experts should take a lead and we all can benefit from it. I think you've uh, given us a fine moment to close out this session. You've been very generous with your time, uh, Madam Ambassador. I think many of us read the glowing profile about you in the Washington Post last week, uh, showing you as a uh, certainly a rock star in the area of information and public diplomacy there in Washington. How did you enjoy that piece? I was flattered and thought it's about some other wonderful person, <laughs> but uh, it was nice to read it. Madam Ambassador, thank you very much for your time and for kicking off this conference with your very stimulating, thought-provoking remarks. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for the Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. And uh, just to add, uh, no, m not many of uh, you know, but Oksana is the uh, long-standing supporter of the press uh, and freedom of the press in Ukraine. And she is, uh, with her personal money, helping and uh, uh, to establish and sustain the uh, library, uh, the uh, mu museum of, of the press in Ukraine. So, Oksana, thank you for that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a great, great conversation. Thank Thanks, colleagues. We'll now um, segue immediately into the next session. It'll take us about two minutes to get adjusted. I don't know if we have Matt Armstrong on the line now, ready to roll. Okay, let me ask Nick Call to join us. Thank you.